Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, January 10th, 2008. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. With this week, home brewer and home baker John Owen from Salem, Massachusetts, walks us through the process of making sourdough bread from the wild yeast that's in our flour and in our kitchens. It may not be beer, but I think we can learn a lot about our friends, the yeasts, by uh, watching them work on a loaf of bread. Well, if you're new to home brewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. We also still have the Brewer's Logbooks in stock, so get one while you can. This is my first episode to be written and edited on my new computer. Of course, the week after I buy my new computer, Apple comes out with new ones that are way better than the one I got. But, you know, that's always, (laughs) it seems like that's always how it goes. But uh, at least I got the purchase in before the end of the year, so my tax guy will be happy. Uh, We got a mention, by the way, in Beer Magazine this month, the basicbrewing.com site was mentioned in an article about online beer resources and mentioned favorably. Thanks to uh, our web designer, Kelly Dotson, down in Austin, uh, for the, uh, the, you know, he got good kudos. He he hardly ever gets, uh, uh, you know, a pat on the back. So it was good to uh, hear some good things about his design in Beer Magazine. Uh, craftbeerradio.com, uh, you know, the Craft Beer Radio guys, they also got a plug, as did our friends at High Gravity, in Tulsa, and I appreciate Desiree uh, from High Gravity uh, letting me know about the story. It's uh, it's good to be in good company. Uh, congratulations go out to Jeffrey T. and the folks at the Good Beer Show for celebrating three years of podcasting. That means our three-year anniversary is about six or seven months away. It's crazy. I can't believe it. Uh, Now that my mailbox is up and running again, let's look into the mailbag. Tim from near Seattle writes in after hearing Molly's email last week about her homebrew tasting hot in a bad way. Tim says, I began listening to your podcast over a year ago while in Afghanistan after a buddy convinced me that I needed to start homebrewing. I also ordered Charlie Papazian's books while over there. Your podcast and the books, which I carried in my rucksack and I read at least three or four times, were very informative and gave me something fun to look forward to when I got home. When I did return, my wife gave me a basic homebrew setup for Christmas and I've been brewing ever since. Well, congratulations for, or, or welcome home, first of all, Tim, and uh, we appreciate your service in Afghanistan and we're, we're happy that, uh, that we could remind you of home while you're over there and give you something to look forward to. Um, Tim continues about Molly's hot beer. She mentioned that she was fermenting at 72 degrees, Uh, depending on the yeast strain that could be on the high end of the temperature range, which can also contribute to high alcohol slash fusel alcohol formation. Tim says, in my experience and from what you and your podcast guests have discussed, it seems like my beer does better when pitched at a lower fermentation temperature, say 65 to 68 degrees, which looking at... uh, Looking at my uh, my handy dandy conversion thing, it looks like around 17 degrees Celsius. Um, Tim says letting my the beer temperature rise naturally as part of the active fermentation process. From my measurements, it's not uncommon for the beer temperature in the middle of the vessel to be three to five degrees Fahrenheit above the ambient air temperature during active fermentation. Well, thanks again, Tim, for your your service, and thanks for the note. And, uh, you know, you're right. You have to keep in mind that the heat of fermentation, uh, when you're looking at your fermentation temperature, the fermentation is going to raise the temperature of the beer as it's fermenting uh, past the the, uh, fermentation or the uh, temperature of the room that you got the fermenter sitting in. So be sure to calculate that in as well. Uh, along those lines, Harp from Alabama writes, I'm looking to start home brewing in the near future. I live in Alabama, and I'm trying to think of a good place to store the beer while it ferments. Do you know of any products that I could use or make to record temperatures over a period of time so that I can see where the ba- best place to ferment and store beer would be? 
Well, that's a good question. I guess you could remind yourself to manually check the temperature of a certain room on a regular basis and, and keep a kind of a written log, but that's not that's no fun. Um, what do you guys think out there? Do you know of a, a good automated solution to recording room temperatures over time in a given space? I know that the, there are gadgets out there, but I don't, you know, the scientific gadgets, but uh, if, if there is a, a reasonable solution to uh, to doing that at home, uh, let me know. Write me at james at basicbrewing.com or use the contact form on basicbrewing.com, and I'll pass that information on and share it with everybody. Gary from Holland, Michigan writes, I confess I didn't hear all of Brewing Nightmares, our Brewing Nightmares episode a couple episodes ago, so perhaps this one was covered but uh, Gary says, one of my stupid moves a few years back was using the washing machine, a clothes washing machine, to iodophore my bottles before filling. Gary says, I put the bottles in the container and let it fill up, put the top down out of habit. And Gary said, when the tub filled, the agitator got a good workout smashing my bottles. <laughs> and Gary says, the second time, yep, I did it twice. I kept the lid up, came back to see that it was all full and soaking nicely. Looks good, Gary says. Might as well put the top down. Whoops! <laughs> Fortunately, Gary says, I was right there and stopped it only after a couple bottles broke. So, there you go. Habits are hard to break. It sounds like something I'd do. Uh, Greg from Muncie, Indiana writes, I was just listening to the Brewing Nightmares episode during my walk to work, and I enjoyed it very much. Thanks, Greg. I must note my displeasure, however, with your offhanded jab at poor Mimi and her book report about scene. We, uh, I had a, I, I told a story about a, a junior high uh, uh, experience where a girl in, in junior high class was talking about a guy named Scene in a book report, and it was S E A N, and uh, she was only told afterwards that it was Sean that she was talking about. Anyway. Uh, Greg says, I flashed back to my own grade school book report about Monkey Island, which I pronounced is land during the whole report, only to be corrected at the very end by the teacher in front of all my classmates. Oh, island, I remember saying. It all makes more sense now. <laughs> Greg says, thanks for making me relive that trauma. Well, sorry about that, Greg. But that also reminds me of the time in, uh, I think it was third grade, that I read about the uh, World War II battle on Tujima in front of the class, um, where they raised the flag there on, you know, the famous photo the, on the top of uh, Tujima raised, you know. Oh, boy. Derek from Salt Lake City writes, I'm a rookie brewer. My now awesome girlfriend, <laughs> she's now awesome, bought me the joy of home brewing and a substantial gift certificate to my local homebrew shop, the Beer Nut in Salt Lake City, uh, for my birthday. Derek says, I brewed five of their kits, then a couple recipes, and now kind of formulate my own all extract. I am at about 20 five-gallon batches, and I want to get into all grain. I've researched the hell out of all grain equipment. I'm excited to get going, but I want your opinion on the best gear slash setup to get. I have about a 1000 bucks to spend, Derek says. I realize this is probably more than enough, yeah, but uh, <laughs> but I want to maximize my dollars, Derek says. Holy smokes. Well, first of all, Derek, um, say hello to everybody at the Beer Nut. We love the Beer Nut. It's one of our favorite shops. We do. We have a f several favorite shops, but they're one of our favorites. Um, but here's my way of thinking. When you're moving from extract to all grain, first of all, you need a mash tun. And uh, Steve Wilkes and I have made mash tuns out of a 10-gallon cylindrical cooler and a rectangular cooler, and they work great. Steve's got a PVC manifold in his, and I've got a hose braid filter. And, by the way, you can see them both on our Stepping into All Grain DVD, which you can find at the Beer Nut for, for considerably less than $1,000. So, <clears throat> but, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, that, that mash tun is not going to set you back much. Then you'll need a, a kettle big enough to boil full batches of wort, if you're not already, and a propane burner to heat your water up quickly. And then you'll need a wort chiller to cool your wort back down after you've heated it up. But that will pretty much get you started in all grain. Now, you can you can spend your money on, like, 
a very nice brew pot with a spigot or you know, and false bottom and all that, uh, which which may be a good thing to do since you've got so much money to spend. And there are more toys and pieces of gear that you can buy. But this is just my way of stink of uh, stinking, <laughs> stinking thinking. Uh, start basic, then uh, then upgrade. That's just the way I would do it. Because uh, you know, if I'm if I'm happy with an initial setup that I get like that with just a basic mash tun and, and kettle and all, then you know you can spend your money on on hops and grain. You know, you can take you know five hundred dollars and buy an ounce of a Cascades, and then uh, <clears throat> you know. But that's just me. What about you out there? If you had a grand to spend on your brewing habit, I mean hobby, what would you buy? Drop me a note and uh, let me know what you guys would spend if you had a thousand dollars. Okay, I received a note uh, not too long ago from Matthew in Malartic, Quebec, Canada, asking about uh, making sourdough bread uh, with Britannomyces instead of regular bread yeast. But uh, that sparked my memory of a previous email message from John Owen, who makes sourdough bread uh, himself. He's a home brewer and also a home baker. Um, Brewing beer and making bread are similar processes in several ways. So I thought, "Ah, that that would be a a good topic. So I asked John to come on the show to get us in touch with our inner baker. Well, John Owen, welcome to Basic Brewing Radio. Happy to be here. This is, uh, for for fans of the show, uh, you know, we haven't uh, talked strictly about home brewing through the past hundred and some odd episodes, but, uh, you know, there is a, a connection with, with beer and making sourdough bread. Is there not? Uh, help me make the connection here so I can legitimize this episode, John. <laughs> well, um, let's go back thousands and thousands of years. No, seriously. <laughs> the um, the connection between brewing and baking is pretty fundamental. In both cases, you're taking the um, enzyme-broken starches of a grain, converting them to sugar, and either using the byproducts of that to, um, in the case of beer, um, make water potable and sanitized, and in the case of bread, um, not using the alcohol so much but using the gas, to uh, create a, you know, an edible product out of something that was previously not very tasty, and I think we can all agree that beer and bread both can be you know, pretty good stuff. Oh, I'll definitely agree with that. Yeah, uh, they both have, or they each have their own effects on us when we eat them. But, uh, <laughs> but my my interest in getting into this is to learn more about yeast and. I figure that if I can learn more about yeast in making bread, that will help me at least conceptualize uh, what's going on with the yeast in my beer. Uh, I mean, they call beer liquid bread, after all. Right. What What came first for you? Was it making bread or was it making beer? Well, I've been baking for probably a dozen years, and for the last five or so, I've been getting into wild yeast sourdough. Mm. Um, and that's actually sort of a... A redundancy. All sourdough bread, by nature, is wild yeast, um, and I'll get back to that in a second. And uh, I started brewing something like two and a half years ago, um, and it did grow out of my interest in, well, in bread because I think fermentation is a fun hobby. Um, my family has baked for you. Know, my mom baked for years. Um, they make their own sauerkraut, which is another fermented product. Mm-hmm. And uh, the idea of you know making uh, making microbes do my bidding <laughs> <laughs> makes me feel like a tiny emperor, uh, and it uh, it's found it really rewarding, and I like it. And um, I did come into home brewing from the home baking world, and there's a lot of there's a lot of similarity of concept, but there are some procedural bits that I think people making the transition need to be aware of that they might want to. Um, prepare themselves for because there's uh, there's some divergences where you can um, lead yourself wrong if you're not aware of what you're doing. So compare and contrast home brewing with home baking. As Charlie Papazian said, relax, don't worry, have a home brew. <laughs> I got to admit, um, my home brewing has gone pretty well. Um, I've made some really great beers, but there is a certain amount of care that goes into intrinsically the making of beer. 
that you don't actually have to get into when making bread. It has a different set of challenges, but um, for example, sanitation is not as big an issue. You're dealing with a time window of hours rather than weeks. Mm -hmm. So anything that gets into the bread is going to die in the oven. Um, so you don't have to worry about you know getting a you know a pedio infection in your homemade bread. Uh, it's it's just not going to happen. Um, and you know and that's I think the the biggest thing is that it's the equipment is another one. Um, although. Over the years, being a geek, I've amassed a pretty big collection of specialized baking gear, like willow baskets from Germany and raw linen towels from France. Really, you can make great bread with two pans, a countertop, and a stove. But what fun is that? Right, absolutely. I mean, half, <laughs> half the fun's the toys, right? Um, but the, uh, I mean, the startup costs are lower for bread, um, and I think the barriers to entry are a little lower because more people bake – it's a little less intimidating, and you get instant feedback on whether you're doing the right thing. Um, you know in a day whether you've made a delicious brick or something that's that's really transcendent. <laughs> and, well, I've waited six months to find out that I really hosed my batch of Belgian strong ale. <laughs> well, there, um, we, know that w we know what yeast does in beer. It, it makes alcohol and it makes CO2. And it makes some other little trace flavors that make each strain individual and interesting. Uh, does yeast do something similar in bread? Does uh, Yeast makes alcohol in bread as well, does it not? It certainly does. Um, yeast in bread, um, although not being a mycologist, I can't speak to it on the, on the micro scale, does exactly the same thing that it does in bread, but it's put to different ends. Um, alcohol is still produced, carbon dioxide is still produced, and uh, you know transition uh, compounds or you know esters and phenols and stuff are still all also produced. Um, when talking about commercial bread yeast, which you know you pick up a packet in the grocery store, take it home, and put it in bread, that's one strain of of yeast. That's a monoculture. Just mm. like if you work for you know one of the big brewers and you made your macro lager, you've got one bug, and it's tuned, and it's ready to go, and it does its thing, and it does exactly that thing well every time. Um, so, you know, that's speaking ideally, what yeast does in bread is produces carbon dioxide by metabolizing sugars present in the flour, which, just like baking, are produced by enzymatic activity, um, diastase and amylase, which should be familiar to brewers, are mm -hmm. responsible for that. It eats the sugar. It produces carbon dioxide and alcohol. Um, the alcohol in baking is extremely negligible. There's a tiny amount produced, and since we're talking about a time frame again of a day usually, uh, it, it's, it's a non-factor, besides which it's volatile and bakes off in the hot oven. What we're really interested in with yeast is what it contributes to, what it contributes to flavor and what it contributes to the rise. Flavor you get from the esters, and you get from partially digested or partially fermented sugars. And rice, you get from all that great CO2. Mm -hmm. And the idea of bread, the idea of leavened bread as a, as a concept is you take wheat generally or some other grain, you mash it around with water to create a protein matrix. Um, a protein called gluten is largely responsible for risen bread. And use that gluten matrix to trap carbon dioxide excreted by yeast. So it's kind of a flip flop of brewing, where in brewing we're more interested in the alcohol, and in baking we're more interested in the CO2. Yeah, that's right. Um, you're emphasizing a different byproduct. The commonality, though, is that you're after flavor. Mm -hmm. And when working with wild yeast sourdough, um, working with bugs as opposed to a highly tuned fermenting machine, You've got a lot more opportunities for flavor. Um, just the zoo of stuff, stuff, bugs that you get is, is pretty mind-boggling. Um, I should say first that wherever you are in the country, wherever you are in the world, if you make a sourdough bread, it's your sourdough bread. I live in Salem, Massachusetts. My sourdough bread is Salem, Massachusetts sourdough. It's not San Francisco sourdough, and it's never going to be because the microflora – in your area really determines, uh, along with the microflora on the flour you buy, 
uh, what bugs are present. You're always going to have some, you know, your old friend, uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. You'll have lactic acid-producing bacteria. You'll have acetic acid-producing bacteria and a bunch of other weirdo ones that uh, fit into a bunch of different uh, genera besides that. So, it's, again, it's like it's like brewing in that they can just open the louvers in Belgium and make good beer. You can't necessarily do that anywhere else in the world. Yeah, that's a, that's absolutely right. You're not going to – although American sour ale is pretty good stuff, um, Belgium seems to really have a lock on it. And to a degree, um, sourdough bread is kind of the lambic of the baking world. So the, the same stuff that makes a, a sour beer makes a sour bread. There is some crossover um, because what obviously makes a beer sour is is acid. Acids taste sour if they're not burning your face off. <laughs> um, lactic acid-producing bacteria are they're responsible for a lot of what you get in lambics. Um, also, there's lactoacidophilus, which is what yogurt um, uh, is populated by mm -hmm. uh, primarily. Um, and acetic acid-producing bugs... Um, Acetic acid is vinegar. They're actually producing a much sourer product than the lactic acid bacteria. They're present in smaller numbers, and they're adding the zing, the pow, to, well, you know, your more undrinkable lambics and to sourdough. Uh, but they, the acids are there exactly as with an interesting Belgian beer to, to make neat flavors happen. So how do you get started? How do you get started in making a sourdough culture? I know that in the old days, you know, traveling west... You, you brought your sourdough starter with you so yep. that you could kind of keep it living and keep it growing and so you can make your bread as you're going down the Oregon Trail or whatever. How do we get started today? Well, uh, it's really, really, really easy. Um, another, another bit of a contrast with, with brewing is making sourdough, getting a sourdough starter going is as easy as forgetting I can do that. Excellent. You're you're done. All you do, <laughs> all all you do, is you make a, a a paste of water and flour, and let it sit. Every couple of days, you take a, you take half away, feed it again, and there's some niceties to the process. But that's basically it. And two weeks later, you can bake sourdough bread. Now, when you say you take half away, what do you mean? You throw it out. Ah. Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit wasteful, but honestly, what you're dealing with is, um, for example, you could go home and take some rye flour. And rye flour is actually really great for starting sourdoughs, partially because of the sugars that it contains and partially because uh, rye grains are really conducive to uh, a, lot of the, a lot of bugs that occur in nature. And those bugs make the rye through the harvesting and milling processes. And they end up in your bag of flour. Every bag of flour is home to billions of viable wild yeasts. Really? Yes. They, I mean, again, they die in the oven. And they're not lean, mean, finely tuned fermenting machines like commercial yeasts. So if you're making a baguette or, or, or just a plain white bread with commercial yeast, they're never going to show up. There's too few of them. They get, they get outcompeted. But with some careful love, you can take the yeast that exists on the flour you buy – and turn them into a starter within two weeks. So you're actually, it's not necessarily the wild yeast that's in your area. It's in the wild yeast of wherever your your grain was harvested. Well, there's uh, there's two sides to that. Um, there is the um, there is the population on the grain that made it into the to the flour. There's also your local water supply. Mm. Unless you've got city water that's really well treated. Um, you've got some stuff living in there, and that's definitely local. And uh, while you're working with these ingredients, you're using your hands, you're using the bowls in your kitchen, you're using the implements in your kitchen, and they all are home to more bugs. And those, again, are resolutely local to your area. Uh, and over time, you will get, and although the differences might be subtle, you know, you're, uh, you're in Arkansas, I'm in Massachusetts. It might be that our sourdoughs taste pretty much the same. Nevertheless, you will get your own custom blend of sourdough that's not quite like anybody else's anywhere. I watched a cooking show one time where a woman started a sourdough 
I, I guess it was a sourdough, by taking grapes and putting that into a you know slurry of, of uh, flour and water. And then after a few days, you know, she had some bugs growing in there. Oh, sure. Um, that was a big, and probably does remain a big method on the West Coast, in, the, in what's really the sourdough capital of the country, um, around San Francisco. That remains a really popular way of getting a sourdough starter going. Uh, grapes, you make wine out of them by crushing them and letting them sit. It's the same deal. They've got, you know, they've got sugar-loving yeasts living right on the skins. And you can do that. Um, but I say, why bother? You could do it with a potato, too. <laughs> um, but it, it, it's, it's a neat trick. But ultimately, um, although you probably are giving the yeast a bit of a head start with all the sugars contained in the grapes, mm. by, the, by the time you get to the baking stage two weeks later, you've been refreshing this nascent starter with flour and water, and any grape character has been almost completely lost. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, uh, it's a way to go, but it works just fine, just literally ma- mixing up a paste of flour and water and leaving it in your kitchen at room temperature. So give us the recipe. What's your mixture of, of flour and water? Okay. Um, well, in baking... You, it's a good idea to go by weight rather than by volume mm. uh, in all things. Uh, baking has got a certain amount of chemistry to it, um, yes, as does brewing. <laughs> um, but it's pretty easy to go wildly off beam if you measure by volume. Say you have a six-cup uh, recipe, meaning it's a six cups of flour going into your final recipe. Um, you reach into your bag of flour with your cup measure, scoop out some flour. It might weigh 4.25 ounces, which is kind of the assumed weight. It could weigh 5 ounces, could weigh 5.5. And, mm. and if you multiply that out over 6 cups of flour, uh, you can end up way off. So what you do to uh, get a sourdough started going is take equal weights, say 4 ounces of each, of water and, and flour. I'd recommend using a whole grain flour. Whole wheat's good to start with. Whole rye even better. And you mix them together, leave them at room temperature for a couple of days, two days. And uh, you'll see some action. You'll see some uh, small bubbles form. It it actually resembles a little bit pancakes cooking. The little bubbles rise to the surface. Hmm. And uh, when you see some action, which is after about 48 hours or so, you pour off half of what you have there and add another four ounces of water and flour. Um, And you just keep doing that. Um, every after you know after the first couple of refreshings, you can do it every day. And what you're doing is by pouring off and refreshing your starter, you're building up the strength and the population of the bugs that live therein, and getting them used to going to work on the sugars in your flour. Hmm. Um, and that's that's honestly it. When you're ready to bake, you take a couple ounces of your starter, you add to it a larger amount of water and flour, let it build up into what in brewing would actually be called high croissant, mm-hmm. you know, really, really cooking. And there's signs you can, you know, signs you can tell that it's ready to go. Then you dump it into whatever your recipe is, flour, water, and salt, and let them feed a couple of hours, bake it. It's delicious. End of story. Wow. We're done. So when you say you pour off, this is not, it's not a doughy consistency. It's more of a gloppy it's it's gloppy. It's it's about a pancake batter consistency, and uh, spoon off is probably a better way to put it. But you can pour. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, one of the effects of um, acids of a low pH environment on gluten, which as I said is what uh, makes bread hang together and and what keeps a batter of flour gloppy. Uh, one of the effects of a low pH environment on gluten is to break it down. So um, you can pretty dependably tell that your starter is overripe is if it's real runny. Hmm. If you started with this one-to-one ratio of water and flour, and a couple of days later you come back and there's a tide line on the side of the bowl, and it smells kind of alcoholic and sharp, and it's runny, your yeast have done all they can do, and now they're taking a break. Hmm. And, uh, yeah. And then you, that's when you pour it off and you add half again. Actually, I uh, let me back up just a little bit and explain how to know when your starter is ready. Uh, let's say you've got 
a certain amount of an active starter. You've got a sourdough culture reasonably well thriving, and you want to build it up to bake. So you, you remove all but a couple of ounces and add a larger portion of flour and water. So say you start with two ounces of starter. Uh, add, now call it three, maybe four ounces each of water and flour. Mix it together and let it stand at room temperature, which I'm calling 65 to 72, although it doesn't matter as much as in brewing. So, so that would be around 20 degrees Celsius. Uh, yes, I believe that's right. Um, and you let that stand. And the way to know that you're ready to refeed the starter or bake with it is when it's well risen, probably doubled, possibly even tripled, depending on how much air that mixture can hold. Like, it will have expanded in the bowl. So you need to use a bigger bowl than you think. <laughs> and it'll have, uh, it'll have begun to dome on top, like, be, you know, thrusting upwards. And if the starter is not quite ready, the top will be sort of flat with some air bubbles on top of maybe a quarter-inch diameter, some smaller. When it's ready, you can start to see what I like to call canals in between sort of little hills of starter it starts to collapse on itself. Hmm. Um, you might see little sort of lines and islands of tiny bubbles collecting in these, in these sort of crevices. That's a great sign. It's high time to feed the starter again. It means that the starter is as active as it's going to be, and it means that uh, whatever you feed it now, it's going to jump on rather than take some time to build back up its strength and get rolling again. So is it similar to the foam falling back into the beer? Yeah, I think that's actually a pretty good analogy. It's um, You, you kind of know that you're done with primary right about the time the foam's gone. You know, it means the yeast have settled down. They're going to start cleaning up their byproducts, which in bread you don't really want, and they're going to take a break. Um, instead, you want them really cooking. And speaking of cooking, mm -hmm. once we get our starter and we add it to a, a larger... Uh, batch of, of flour and water and get our uh, our true dough going. Yep. Give us some tips on how do we proceed from there. Okay. Now, working with a sourdough bread, um, if you've baked uh, white bread and wheat bread before, um, a lot of people have. Um, you're probably familiar with, you know, the mixing and kneading processes and rising. But there are some important differences between baking your average white bread loaf and a sourdough loaf. Uh, one of them is texture. Um, in addition to breaking down gluten a little bit, um, it also seems that sourdough breads that are just a little, uh, you know, a little more acidic, they'll have a lower pH than your regular old bread, they're stickier. And when I say stickier, it means your first time, it's going to be on your hands, it's going to be on your shirt, it's going to be all <laughs> over the counter, and you're going to end up with a, with a loaf the size of a dinner roll and go, what did I do? <laughs> um, keep with it. That's the hardest part, is learning how to handle a dough that doesn't want to cooperate. Um, there's some great implements out there. There's a, a bowl scraper or a dough scraper. Um, it's just a flat piece of plastic that's rounded on one side, so you can scrape out a bowl or you can scrape dough off the counter. You can use that as a hand, um, or you hold your hands like paddles, which is to say keep your fingers together so that dough doesn't get all over them. <laughs> Um, that's a big and important difference that, that a lot of people struggle with when they're starting to work with sourdoughs. Um, and the other side of that is people tend to make sourdough bread at a higher hydration level than they do traditional breads. Um, what, and the reason for this is the more water you put into a bread, uh, the sort of the more artisan the texture is, meaning big holes in the crumb, you know, an open crumb, uh, a slightly chewier texture, and a nice crisp crust. Um, if you're baking French bread, the standard French bread recipe, the classic uh, formula calls for, I believe, it's 60% water to 100% flour. So if you've got a pound of flour in the recipe, uh, six-tenths of a pound of wa uh, water is what you would use. In sourdough baking, it's closer to 70%. Some people go nuts and go as high as 75 Wow. That's runny, mm -hmm. and it's hard to work with. Yeah, my I've, I've been baking uh, bread, making pizza crust yeah. for just a short time, and my solution is to throw more flour at it. Yeah, it's a bad idea. Um, to a, it, it's a bad idea until you get your, your head around what's going on. Mm -hmm. The reason I say this is 
um, before the gluten matrix really comes together in a dough, um, it's going to be pointing every which way. And the ends of those protein strands are going to be sticky because they're looking for something to hook up with. So in a lot of bread baking, and sourdough baking is this doubled, you're going to have the first three or four minutes of, of kneading by hand where it's just going to be an awful, sticky, chaotic mess. But if you keep at it, it'll straighten up, fly right, and you'll have a nice, soft, beautiful loaf um, or a beautiful mass of dough that is maybe tacky but not sticky. The thing is, if you add more flour too early, you're throwing off the, the recipe's formula. And just like in brewing, if you're going for a certain target gravity, a certain terminal gravity, and a certain flavor profile, you don't just go adding another pound of, of malt. You don't go, you know, adding another pound of steeping grains. It's, it's going to mess you up. And you're going to have an un, unexpected outcome. And with baking, it's the same. If you add extra flour really early on, it can make a dry loaf. Mm. You'll, you'll end up being more likely to have a loaf that's it's a brick. It'll taste good, but it'll be a brick. It'll be too heavy for the yeast's uh, carbon dioxide output to lift. So if the, if the dough is sticky, even in normal baking, if you work with it a little while, the proteins will... Line, you stick to each other rather than sticking to you and everything else in the kitchen, and you'll come out with a better product in the end. That's right. Have faith and stick with it. Um, and be bold. Um, I'm up to now, because I, I like to push the envelope with baking a little bit, because it's fun. And I've been doing it long enough that I think, <laughs> I, I fool myself <laughs> that I know what I'm doing. Um, so if I, if I push the hydration level on a nice ciabatta recipe, for example, up to 80%, which is kind of soupy, um, at this point, I can work with that pretty confidently without losing it all over the kitchen. But it's taken me a few years to get to that point. But like I said, this is I'm doing sort of the extreme beer version of bread now, you know, crazy stuff. And for the purposes of baking your first few sourdough loaves, my advice is stick with it. Don't worry about the stickiness. R- write it out, and it will resolve itself. So the, uh, the starter that we've left behind, yep. it still goes? It does. You feed it and keep it going. Um, I'll get back to that in just a moment. Um, I want to cover a couple more bits about how, how sourdough bread behaves. I got a little sidetracked in the stickiness because it's a it's very <laughs> tactile fault. sensation. I'm four years old on the inside, so I, I like <laughs> stuff to touch. One of the other properties of a sourdough bread is um, the acid has an effect on a tightening effect on the gluten. So you tend to have a, uh, a, a crumb. When you're eating it, it's chewier. It's got a pull to it. It's, mm-hmm. got, it's got bite. Mm-hmm. And it also has tends to have larger holes because acid eats away at the protein, eats away at your dough, and gives you big gaps for carbon dioxide to collect in, um, which is kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Um, you're not going to see that as much at home because the conditions in a commercial bakery, like both how the bakers handle the dough and how the oven operates, are more conducive to that, but you'll see that. Um, and the final difference is um, browning reactions tend to be inhibited in a lower pH environment. So those nice Maillard reactions, the caramelization reactions that you get that turn the crust from something pale and flavorless into beautiful golden brown crunchy deliciousness, they happen a little more slowly in a lower pH dough. So you tend to bake a little bit longer, and you may tend to bake a little bit higher. Hmm. Uh, I make a five-pound sourdough loaf. It's a big round. It's, it's, it's a great show loaf. It's really fun. It's a trick. Um, and I bake that at an initial temperature of 475. Wow. And then put the oven down to 425 over the course of the hour that, it, that it's in the oven. But that 475 really helps to get the yeast kick-started in the oven. And because what happens is in the oven, um, yeast, bread yeast, work at a very wide temperature range, unlike, unlike beer. Um, from 44 or so up to 120, they're active. And so when you put your dough in the oven and the temperature of that loaf starts to rise, the yeast just flip out, eat all the available sugar they can, and then they die <laughs> and leave you with your nicely risen loaf. It's called oven spring, and it's a nice thing to behold. Yeah, that's that's the part of uh, uh, brewing and and baking that I don't like to think about. You know, we we consume our servants there. And <laughs> it, it, again, I, I like to consider myself the empire, the emperor of a tiny dominion. 
<laughs> and a cruel emperor at that. Um, you make them work and then you eat them. Yes, yes. Um, but like I said, one big difference between brewing and baking, um, and this is a little bit off topic, is that um, bread yeast can be manipulated temperature-wise a lot more than beer yeast can. Hmm. Um, you know, you got your standard American ale yeast. It works pretty well at 65 to 70, maybe down to 62 degrees Fahrenheit, maybe a little higher than 70 degrees. Um, but that's really it. It'll go dormant or it'll produce off flavors if you go outside that spectrum too much. Mm -hmm. But bread yeast, um, you can take advantage of the fact that it works, albeit slowly, at very low temperatures and works very quickly at high temperatures to manipulate your outcome. Uh, in the case of sourdough, low temperatures favor the production of acetic acid, which is vinegar, which is real, real sharp. And so if you stick your loaf that's in the middle of its final rise in the fridge overnight, you'll tend to have a more sour loaf. Huh. Yeah. Um, and you can also use this and also hydration levels, which is probably a little more advanced uh, than I want to get into here. You can manipulate the hydration level of your starter to favor one bug over another to, to get a, a more sour product. There's a lot of fiddling you can do, and it's pretty much costless in the sense that you're not going to kill this thing. <laughs> Unless you forget and bake the whole thing, you're not going to kill it. <laughs> have you ever done that? I'm happy to say I have not. I came really horribly close to killing Herman. I named it. It's Herman. But I'd, uh, I had I had bowl scrapings from the last from from when I fed him up to go into him up to go into the into the dough, and uh, it amounted to less than a tablespoon of of starter, probably a teaspoon all told, and within a few days I was back. Wow. I'm not, I'm not going to ask you how you sex a uh, uh, starter. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's just like a duck. you gotta, you got to blow on the hindquarters. <laughs> and then if it slaps you, it's a lady. Um, I, I've seen them do it to, to baby chicks, but not to, not to bread. No. It's, um, <laughs> it, it just occurred to me one day, hey, this thing's named Herman. Um, I don't know what that says about me, but there you go. You too will have the urge to name your starter. <laughs> this, I promise, each and every one of you. So so you, you get you get to have it for a long time? Yeah. Do you, do you have to leave it with somebody when you go on vacation to feed no, it? No, and... that's the great part. That's the great part. Traditionally, before the age of refrigeration, you'd have to feed this thing every day or it would go dormant. Mm. But back in the day, you did bake with it every day. You, you fed it every day. It wasn't that big a deal. Um. You know, the, the first commercial bakeries were sourdough bakeries, and they kept a piece of the previous day's product and fed it back into what they were doing. Um, that's how they kept their starter. And today, we can take, the, take advantage of the miracle of refrigeration in this 21st century jet age of ours and put our starter in the fridge. What happens in the refrigerator is um, a starter that you fed and let grow for a couple of hours before you refrigerate it will consume some of what's there and then begin to work very, very slowly. It'll go mostly dormant. Every week or so, you want to take the starter out of the fridge, let it come back to room temperature and wake up. Then you're going to feed it again just like normal. And if you're not going to bake with it this time, let it grow for a couple of hours and pop it back in the fridge. That's it. I actually, uh, this weekend, fed Herman for the first time in a month. Wow. It was fine. Um, there was a lot of hooch on top. Um, <laughs> there, there. You, you can, uh, you can identify a dormant starter, by the way, by the fact that it has fallen, and this is from the fridge that it has fallen. It's kind of dense, uh, and there's a large amount of gray fluid, sort of glopping around on top. That's your alcohol. Mm. Um, you pour that off. You throw out some of the starter. You feed it up. It's fine. But it's it's a pretty low intensity pet to have. It's even better than a goldfish. <laughs> and you can pull pizza, pieces of it off and eat it. Yeah. So, well, <laughs> so it's like a lizard. <laughs> yeah, this thing's great. It does everything. Now, uh, one of the reasons that I, I decided to do this show is uh, I got an email asking about. Uh, uh, well, in one of our um, our brewing disaster stories was about uh, using. Uh, 
the uh, the trube from a, a batch of beer and, and I guess leaving too much hop trube in it and getting a bitter uh, bread. Yeah, you get that. Um, but uh, also we had a question about, uh, and I'm sorry I don't have the email in front of me, uh, a question about using uh, wild beer yeast in in making bread. I see. Like, uh, you know, Britannomyces and, and uh, you know, wild, wacky beer yeasts to make bread and, and what effect that that would have. And I take it you haven't had any experience with that yet. I've actually begun an experiment at home, a mad yeast experiment. Uh-huh. Um, this weekend, um, it was a big weekend, I finished a bottle of um, Omegang Brewery's Saison, mm. um, which is a really nice, really nice beer. They're hennepin. Highly recommended. But I saved the um, dregs from that bottle, and it's bottle fermented. And I also finished a bottle of uh, Gez Boon, um, and save the leavings from that bottle. And I put them into, I put them each into their own little starter, as if I were building a wild yeast sourdough. Mm-hmm. And what I've seen so far, it's been, it's only been three days, but I'm already beginning to draw a few conclusions about uh, this process. I think a couple of the obstacles that someone who wishes to bake with wild beer yeast would need to overcome when baking bread. Um, First is the temperature issue. Um, Bread is pretty relaxed. You let it rise at 65, great. You let it rise at 72, it's going to move a little faster, but no big whoop. You let it rise at 45, it's going to take a long time, but you'll develop great flavors. You do that with any given population of beer bugs, they're all going to go dormant. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's, that's a consideration. You need to bring something into home baking, which is a little bit alien, which is rigorous temperature control. Um, Commercial bakeries are fanatical about temperature because it affects time, but home bakers, you don't have to. So you need to make sure that if you're going to be using a a wild beer culture in bread, that you stay within the recommended temperature range for that that general group of, of yeasts. The other part is time. It takes years for pediococcus to make a big impact. It makes it takes months or years for Brettanomyces to make a big impact on a beer. And with bread, you're really working with a matter of hours to days. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, based on what I've seen so far, I really don't know if they thrive in the um, starter culture of, of a bread. I'm smelling my, uh, my tests as I feed them, and I'm getting nothing. Really, very little. Um, Herman has a lot of really exciting sort of yogurty, delicious smells coming off of him as I feed him. But there's very little nose to the to the uh, saison and the gaz dregs as I as I refresh them. In fact, little activity too. Hmm. Um, the saison went nuts on Sunday when I was cooking, and the temperature in the kitchen probably hit 78. But um, you know, it went really nuts. Went ripe. Was done. Oh my gosh, that was fast. But um, it really didn't seem to produce a whole lot of exciting flavors. It's really a great uh, avenue for exploration. But I think with those caveats in mind, you maybe maybe Brett's not the the one to try first. Um, I think if you control your temperatures, it's it's definitely worth seeing what you can get out of a bottle of sour Flanders Red. Could it be that over time, uh, those effects will be magnified and that you'll you'll pick up things. Uh, over time, has has Herman evolved over time in the way that uh, it tastes or he tastes and smells? Um, Herman has not evolved all that much, at least not noticeably. And honestly, outside of specialized regions of the world, uh, like San Francisco, um, there's not going to be a marked variation in the taste of sourdough. I mean, okay, if I went to Kenya and started a sourdough culture, it would taste different than than Massachusetts. But you know, going again from Massachusetts to Arkansas, I don't expect there to be a huge, uh, huge difference. My my intuition is that your yeasts that, that come in on the grain and in the water are probably going to outcompete mm. some of the strains that you get from your wild beer culture. I could be wrong, and I'm going to keep this going and, and see if I can bake a loaf within the next week or two with each the the gas and the saison. Um, starters. See what I get. 
Um, and I think over the course of a couple of weeks, I, you know, if there's flavors that are going to appear, they probably would have started. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and after that, my attention will drift and I'll forget about it. <laughs> Well, be sure to, uh, to to let me know how that comes out. I'll make sure to do that. Now, for, for those who want to learn more, what are some resources online or otherwise that uh, that you recommend for, you know, seeing the process in action or, or reading in more detail about sourdoughs? Sure. Um, well, for being a... For being a big computer nerd, I'm actually surprisingly short on online baking resources, although there are some out there, and I do know them to be excellent. I myself go the book route, Hmm. Um, partially because you really can't bring the computer with you into the kitchen um, without some some risk. (laughs) Um, Flower and the keyboard is not fun. Yeah, not good at all. Um, There are a couple of books that I very much favor that... They, you don't necessarily want them to be your very first baking book. Um, for that, I think the King Arthur Baking Book is a good one. Um, they also, I believe, have a bread book, the King Arthur Flour Company, that's good stuff. Ah. Uh, they have sourdoughs in there, and they're, and they're a good resource for the home baker for all things. They've really spent the last decade um, building a lot of equity among home bakers as the place to go to answer questions, to get recipes um uh, designed for the home baker that tastes like what you'd get in a professional bakery, they're a good place to go. Um, I like a couple of books. One is by a guy named Peter Reinhardt. Uh, He's a professional baker and a culinary teacher, and it's called The Bread Baker's Apprentice. Hmm. Um, He's got a really good explanation of how to build a sourdough culture from nothing, like I described, and some recipes that are just out of this world in there, uh, both sourdough and not. Another would be Maggie Glazer's Artisan Baking Across America. Uh, It's about six or seven years old now, uh, but what she did was went around the country and met and interviewed some of the foremost small bakers, you know, the micro bakers Mm -hmm. in beer parlance, for their techniques, their baking setups, and their recipes, and did a book on each, you know, with a section on each. showcasing some of their best stuff. And she also has a very good explanation on keeping and working with a sourdough culture. Um, She goes a slightly different route. Peter Reinhardt recommends the home baker keep their starter in a liquid form, which is what I've described in this show. Mm -hmm. Maggie Glazer has you do more of a a dough. It's like a ball of dough that's your sourdough starter. And uh, I don't like it for my reasons, but it's another way to go. Um, and the third one I would recommend, although this is for advanced people only, it's, it, will, it will scare you off if you're just coming to baking because it's written primarily for professionals, is Jeffrey Hamelman's Bread, A Baker's Book of Techniques and Recipes. Great, great, great recipes in that book, although it's definitely not for noobs. <laughs> um, finally, um, there are local classes all around the country on how to bake sourdough bread, um, the King Arthur Flour Company, who are up in Vermont, which isn't totally accessible from most places in the country, they do classes all the time. Um, they're inexpensive. They're fun. I've taken a few. They're extremely informative. I've learned an enormous amount from putting my hands into dough with the oversight of a trained professional. Mm-hmm. There's nothing like it. Um, and the final thing I have to, to recommend for the home brewer is the last and ultimate frontier in home baking is making your own oven. Uh. Go to the backyard, make an oven. <laughs> Fire the wood and make some stuff. Um, if, if you're the kind of home brewer who has his own um, full grain setup in the basement, you're doing 15-gallon batches, you're grinding your own grain to spec, th- you know, this, this is your next step. This is your next project is make yourself your own wood-fired oven in your backyard. Then you know that you're a true Home baker. Oh, yeah. I aspire to that someday, but first I've got to get away from apartment life. <laughs> well, John, this has been fun. Yes, it has. Thanks it, for having me. Well, I, I appreciate your coming on, and I appreciate your sharing your knowledge. Well, it's my pleasure. And uh, w- I may be forwarding some emails to you, if you don't mind. Bring it on. I'll do what I can. <laughs> well, uh, John Owen from Salem, Massachusetts, thanks a lot. Thank you. Well, thanks again to John. After we talked... John had a couple more points to add. John says, One other quality that wild yeast imparts to the loaf 
is excellent keeping quality. The low pH actually inhibits spoilage. I've kept a sourdough loaf in my kitchen at room temperature for up to two weeks with no sign of mold. The flavor actually changing each day as the chemistry of the loaf evolves over time. John says, uh, I've read that 100% rye breads, which are always sourdough, can keep for up to six weeks at room temperature if properly handled. Try that with a supermarket loaf. And John also says, one of life's great pleasures is making a meal of bread and beer you yourself have made with cheese from a local artisan maker, or if you're really dedicated, is also made by you, by your own hand. John says, it's ironic that I'm taking high pleasure in what is essentially a medieval supper. But the good things are, evidently, eternal. There you go. Thanks again, John. If you have uh, brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. The 2008 Brewers Logbooks are still here. Check them out on our site. Check out our low-tech lagering and decoction mashing DVD where you can see Steve do a single-step decoction mash and follow me through a lager fermentation in the middle of summer here in northwest Arkansas where I don't use a dedicated chest freezer. There are also our original DVDs in Basic Brewing, Introduction to Extract Home Brewing. We walk you through the extract brewing process step-by-step from boiling to bottling. And in Basic Brewing, Stepping to All Grain, we take you through the all grain process from milling your grain to collecting your wort. We got new combo deals. And you can see a listing of the fine folks across our, our the country, our country, and other countries who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order it from us online in our new and improved online shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link. We appreciate the support there. Our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are Philips DVP5960 DVD player with HDMI 1080i upscaling DivX Ultra USB Direct and Prenatal Yoga with Shiva Ray. Thanks again, everybody. And remember, I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping, and we appreciate your support there. Well, that's all until next week. Until then, thanks for listening. I'm James Spencer, production help for Basic Brewing Radio, and our website is provided by Kelly Dotson, our buddy down in Austin, who also designed our logo. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long. Thank you.